Is this the video that could single-handedly save your upcoming trip? We hate crowds in Disney World, and we work hard to figure out all the secrets to avoid them. Learn how to navigate around one of the biggest Disney World problems in 50 different ways today here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Since crowded parks are a major bummer in Disney World, we thought they deserved a big list of solutions. So we're listing off all the different methods you can turn to in order to help cut down on wait times, keep your group together, and keep away the crowd burnout in general. Because this list is extensive, we do have all these tips already typed up for you on a separate PDF. We can send it over your way if you drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash avoid crowds. All right, here we go. First tip, attend the second show. Rule of thumb, if Disney lists a second showing for one of the parades like Festival of Fantasy, holiday entertainment offering, like the Once Upon a Christmas Time Parade or nighttime spectaculars like Fantasmic, then go to the second one. Historically speaking, first show times tend to be the most popular, especially for those evening shows, because not everyone's gonna be quite as thrilled to see these performances when lethargy strikes and you're getting ready to wrap up for the day. And that means crowds tend to be a little less prominent once the second show rolls around. That gives you the chance to experience these spectacles while things are looking less people-y out there. Tip two, choose Animal Kingdom as your second park. On lots of occasions, guests who invest in park hopper add-ons will flip this strategy and plan to visit Animal Kingdom as their first park of the day. And that's because Animal Kingdom closes earlier than everybody else, around 7 or 8 p.m. But that means Animal Kingdom is relatively uncrowded by the time 2 p.m. rolls around because everybody started there and then they park hopped elsewhere. That means you could potentially jump over to Animal Kingdom around that same time and still get five to six hours of Disney park time in, riding rides and catching shows without having to constantly constantly push against waves of people all evening long. And if you have a park hopper, you can always hop to another park after it closes. Next on our list, dine at out of the way restaurants. If you know you're gonna want to escape the park sometime during your trip because the park crowds can get way too intense for anything to be considered fun, you can always plan ahead and make a reservation for a Disney restaurant that feels as far away from the crowds as possible. Need a few recommendations? Well, Toledo Tapas Steak and Seafood is located on the top floor of Coronado Springs' Grandestino Tower, serving Spanish cuisine and vintage wines for a classy evening out. You may even be able to catch the Epcot fireworks if you time your visit right. Looking for something a little bit less expensive at Coronado Springs? We always recommend a late afternoon visit to Three Bridges Bar and Grill. It's an awesome lounge, it's outdoors, and they have the best cheese dip you will ever have. Over on the Animal Kingdom side, head to Boma at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge. This offers up a buffet of African-inspired dishes, and it's also where the Zebra Dome desserts originated, for which we are eternally grateful. And as your wild card option, if you want to try Il Molino New York Trattoria at Walt Disney World Swan Hotel, this is a modern contemporary restaurant that's serves traditional dinners from the Abruzzi region of Italy. They do it really, really well. And there are tons more really good restaurants to try. If you want lunch, you can head over to Grand Floridian Cafe. That's one of our favorite places to have lunch. There's lots of hotel restaurants. There's lots of Disney Springs restaurants. They're gonna be far away from the park crowds. Avoid traveling during extended weekends. All right, so sometimes traveling during extended weekends like Labor Day or Memorial Day weekend, you know, those three-day weekends, can't be avoided. It may be your only chance at a quick weekend getaway. And that's why the parks are so incredibly crowded because everyone else traveling during this time has the exact same idea. If you've got time off, might as well use it. If you have more flexibility in your schedule though, or you saved up vacation days, it may be better to spend those vacation days and invest them toward a Disney trip that's not gonna have you pushing past hordes of guests your entire time. But actually, you maybe want to avoid visiting the parks on weekends in general. Let's take that one step further. If you have vacation flexibility, avoid visiting the parks on the weekend. If you hit up a Disney park on the weekends, you're not only going to be navigating around those out of town crowds, but also the locals who have the day off and want to slip into their home park for a bit. Since weekends have the potential of being twice as crowded as they could be during the weekdays, surge prices may also be listed on the lower end of the price spectrum if you decide to visit between Monday and Thursday. So you might be able to save money on tickets, hotel rooms, Genie Plus, even ride shares, just by picking a random Tuesday for your Disney visit over a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. 
steer clear of the feature pools. Disney resorts have fun feature pools with great theming, massive water slides, but they also become a very popular hangout destination around the afternoon. For a more peaceful swim, I'd recommend taking a dip in one of the quiet leisure pools instead, since your resort will have more than one pool option. And it's hard to remember sometimes when the feature pools demand all the attention. Here are a few of my favorite leisure pools. Disney's Yacht Club. The leisure pools here are highly overlooked because they've got to compete with the likes of Storm Along Bay, which is Yacht and Beach Club's shared feature pool that's basically a mini water park. Now, the Yacht Club leisure pools are super hard to find, too, so a lot of people don't even stumble on those. And they're usually very quiet. Disney's Boardwalk Inn, they've got leisure pools. One is off to the right of the Boardwalk's feature pool, Luna Park Pool, and the other is tucked away, hidden by the strip of businesses with Boardwalk Deli, Trattoria Al Forno, and Abracadabra. And at Disney's Coronado Springs, once again, Coronado's feature pool, the Lost City of Cibola Pool. That tends to be the golden child of the pool family, leaving the other three leisure pools in the shadows, which is fine by me. If you make your way to the Casita Leisure Pool, you'll find this one has lane line markers in case you want to do some laps with all that extra swimming room you're going to have. Purchase the latest DFB Dining Guide. Had to throw it in here, right? In our 2023 DFB Guide to Walt Disney World Dining, we've got sections dedicated to avoiding the crowds while eating around the parks. We also have an in-depth list of all the dining options that you can study up on before your visit so you can get ahead of the crowds and know which restaurants you'll want to make advanced dining reservations for 60 days before your trip, including the ones that are going to be a little bit quieter and amazing. To pre-order this guide, head to the DFB Store website, and if you pre-order today, you'll also get the 2022 Dining Guide thrown in there for an immediate download absolutely free. We want you to be able to start planning as soon as you get it. But don't forget to type in the code YouTube over at dfbstore.com for even more savings. Invest in TSA PreCheck. It's not just the Disney World parks that get wildly packed out. It's the Orlando International Airport, too. If you want to skip the forever long lines for the MCO security checks when you're trying to get back home post Orlando vacation, you can always invest in TSA PreCheck, which allows authorized travelers to skip the long wait and hop into a separate line at security, like a lightning lane for plane rides. To enroll, you'll need to pay 85 bucks, show a valid ID and proof of citizenship, a passport or birth certificate, and you'll also be required to take a photo during the enrollment process. You can enroll online to be TSA approved before your next trip, or you can enroll at MCO over at the security screening area, which will take you three to five days to be approved, but will give you the all clear for the next five years worth of flights after that. So you could go ahead and apply at MCO when you arrive to Disney World, and then when you leave, you could already be approved. I've had TSA PreCheck for a long time, and it has never steered me wrong. That thing is so useful. Use baby care centers. It's not just the adults who have to deal with the constant flow of guests everywhere you turn. It's the little ones too. If your kid seems to be getting overstimulated by all the hustle and bustle buzzing around, you may want to track down one of the baby care centers inside the park. The baby care centers give you and your baby or toddler or younger kid the chance to cool down, take a breather, and maybe settle in for a snack, a diaper change, or a quick cat nap. This is also a great place to go with older kids who are getting overstimulated and just need Need some quiet for a little bit. Don't forget about the other tip board. The Disney Genie tool has another tip board for you to use, and this one covers the dining side of things. Are the crowds getting a little too out of hand and you weren't expecting to feel this stressed out? The dining tip board can show you any last minute dining reservations for restaurants inside the parks with lingering availability to provide sanctuary away from the madness that is Disney during the afternoon rush. You may also be able to join a virtual walk-up wait list for a restaurant or lounge. As far as quick service goes, if you're noticing the fast food lines in the parks are getting a little too out of hand, the dining tip board can show you when the next available mobile order pickup time is and for which quick service restaurant. That way you can mobile order some fast food from the restaurant that'll hook you up with Grub ASAP. Take the roads less traveled. There are some Disney World paths that can bottleneck really badly, but then there are the secret paths that'll give you room to spread out and keep others at a distance where they're not constantly stepping on the back of your heels. Here are some of my favorite hidden paths and walkways that I take as often as I can. The walkway between Magic Kingdom and Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa isn't just a convenient trail for Grand Floridian guests. It's also a nice trail for anybody looking to decompress and take in the scenic views of the resort and Seven Seas Lagoon. 
Inside Magic Kingdom, however, there are several underrated paths you can wander down, like the boardwalk that goes around Frontierland and passes directly by the rivers of America, since most guests seem to stick to the main road unless the Festival of Fantasy Parade is going on, and they're trying to get around that hullabaloo. This boardwalk is usually a less packed out alternative. Over at Disney's Animal Kingdom, you can travel into the Pandora World of Avatar section from the Africa section of the park for a really uncrowded, unbothered, but really pretty stroll across a wooden bridge. You'll find this walkway directly past Festival of the Lion King on the Africa side. There'll be a stone archway you'll have to walk under to reach it. If you want to park hop by foot, there's actually a way to pull this off too. You can walk to Epcot from Disney's Hollywood Studios and vice versa by using the path that also connects to Disney's Boardwalk Inn, Yacht and Beach Club, and the Disney Disney World Swan and Dolphin Hotels. Visit during non-peak seasons. Classic tip coming your way. There are three months during the year when you're more than likely going to see fewer crowds. Mid-January, because the holiday seasons have wrapped up and everyone's going back to the old work grind, although you want to avoid Martin Luther King weekend. The end of August, because kids are heading back to school after summer break. And September, because kids are still heading back to school post-summer vacation. Much like booking a trip on a weekday versus a weekend, travel prices around these months tend to drop into a lower surge range than if you were visiting in, say, March during spring break season or December during the Christmas season. Skip Starbucks. Sorry, all you Java chip Frappuccino fans out there, but if you truly want to avoid the crowds as much as feasibly possible, you're going to want to avoid the areas of the parks that sell Starbucks. Because it doesn't matter where you are, people love them, their Starbies, and they will spend their time in line for it instead of spending their time in line for something else. And there are no lightning lanes for Starbucks. If you need a Starbucks hit, you can always use the Starbucks mobile order app to skip the physical line for the Starbucks locations in Disney Springs, the one in the marketplace next to World of Disney, or the one on the west side next to the Aerophile Balloon Dock. Otherwise, you'll have to stand in line to order your Starbucks inside the park since mobile order for those locations isn't available even on the My Disney Experience app. Otherwise, you may want to try one of the Joffrey's coffee kiosks, which seem to be relatively less busy, or you can brew yourself a cup of joe in your hotel room before you leave for the day instead, since pretty much every Disney World hotel room will have a Keurig or coffee pot as an amenity, not including a few of the rooms over at Disney's All-Star Sports. Don't want to wait in line to check out at the Magic Kingdom Emporium gift shop? You do not have to. That's right. There's merchandise without standing in line, mobile checkout. The My Disney Experience app has a merchandise mobile checkout feature for the most popular Disney gift shops on site. Just select the merchandise mobile checkout link, which you can access by tapping on that little hamburger menu at the bottom right hand side of your screen, or select the shop in store link, which will pop up when you tap the plus button on the bottom middle portion of your screen. From from there, you're going to select the store you're currently standing in, and the app will walk you through the rest of the checkout process from there. Also, if none of that made sense, just scan the QR code at the places where it says mobile checkout, and it'll bring you right to it. Just make sure all your payment information is linked to your Disney profile beforehand. It's super, super easy to do. Go ahead and scan the stuff you want to buy, check out, and then go to a mobile checkout cast member who will bag up your stuff for you and check your receipt. I was recently wandering around the Emporium just wanting to buy a baseball cap because it was raining outside and I wanted the rain to not get on my face. And all I wanted was a baseball cap and I had it in my hand and the lines were forever long. And then I remembered mobile checkout and it was like a light bulb went on over my head. I was so excited. I went up to the mobile checkout cast member and was like, I'm so glad you're here. It was great. Next, you may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. If you want a surefire way to bypass major ride lines all day long, you're going to want to invest in Genie Plus and or those individual lightning lanes. Disney Genie Plus ranges between $15 to $30 per person per day and gives you lightning lane access for over 40 attractions. And individual lightning lanes range between $10 and $17 per person per ride. And they give you lightning lane access to the most popular rides in each park, which are not included in the regular Genie Plus purchase. Now, we do have a video that goes more in depth with all the different lightning lane features, but please keep in mind that Genie Plus rules have been known to frequently switch up. You can also go to our lightning lanes catch all page on the DFB website for a list of rules and prices and strategies. It's all there. We're here to help. 
And even if you're not too keen on the idea of paying for line bypassing services, you can still use the free Disney Genie tool to help you navigate Disney on its busiest days. So you want to study Disney Genie whether you pay or not. The attractions and shows tip board will let you see current and forecasted wait times for rides and other experiences so you can figure out the best time to get in certain queue lines during the day. I'd recommend getting an early start, checking out the wait times before your trip kicks off. That way, you've already got a feel for when certain ride lines tend to drag more than others. Our friends over at allears.net also track wait times with weekly blog posts for all the four parks, so make sure to pay them a visit and stay in the know. When you're navigating the dining tip board part of Disney Genie, trying to track down any sort of last minute table service availability, you may not love the options you're left with. Now, I've been seeing a lot of really good options recently, but who knows if that's gonna change. So that's why it's a good idea to book advanced dining reservations for the parks in preparation for those afternoon crowds. That way you'll not only guarantee an escape inside a building with glorious amounts of AC, but you'll also know that the restaurant you're booking has a menu that everyone in your group is gonna vibe with. So reserving a table service restaurant inside the parks could kind of get you out of the massive crowds outside for a little while. You can plan a resort-only day as well. Whether you're staying at a Disney hotel or not, try to schedule in a resort-only break day during your trip, especially if you're planning on being there for longer than a two-day getaway. Though guests staying at certain resorts will be the only ones allowed to swim in the pools on site, you can still explore the other offerings that each location has available around their lobbies, their restaurants, etc. You can book a kayak for 13 bucks per hour at Disney's Fort Wilderness, travel around property in a horse-drawn carriage for 55 $5 for 25 minutes at Disney's Port Orleans Riverside or lounge in a beachside hammock at Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort for free. There's tons more to explore around each of the different resorts. Just keep in mind that if you aren't staying as a guest at the resort you're trying to visit or you don't have a pre-existing dining reservation, then you won't be able to drive up to the resort in your own vehicle and park there. Instead, you'll need to take Disney's complimentary transportation services from the parks or the Disney Springs Shopping District. Now with the crowds in Disney World, you're definitely gonna wanna keep tabs on your group. There's more to stress over about the mob of guests you'll endure during your trip than just seeing super long wait times everywhere you turn. There's also the added stress of making sure everyone in your group sticks together and no one accidentally wanders off. A good way to keep an eye on everybody in your party is to make sure all your group members are easy to spot. So while you're packing your suitcase, remember to pack outfits with bold and bright colors that you'll be able to pick out easily in a crowd. You can also also wear matching shirts that don't blend in with others that you may see overpopulating the walkways. That way everybody sort of looks the same in your group and you can grab them all. We got some rather spiffy family shirts ourselves for sale at the DFB Store website. That's merch.dfbstore.com. And those will check all the boxes. They've got bold, unique Disney designs, bright color choices, and styles that come in various sizes for adults and kids of all ages. And if you get those, you're automatically supporting our channel, so we appreciate it. One of my favorite tips to get away from the crowds is escaping to side exhibits. Epcot is a treasure trove of underrated side exhibits that you can visit at no extra charge for some peace and quiet and air conditioning. Side exhibits can be found all around the World Showcase and aren't just great places to escape droves of guests, but are also very educational. Even when I'm not feeling completely overwhelmed, I still like to dip into these spots and read up on each country's cultural history and check out the unique international displays. So where can you find these little exhibits? In the China Pavilion, there's the inside Shanghai Disneyland Resort Gallery, which is to the left of the Temple of Heaven. Inside the American Adventure Building, you can explore the American Heritage Gallery featuring rotating exhibits and interactive displays that tell the history of traditional native influences. The Japan Pavilion has the Bijutsu Kan Gallery at the back of the Mitsukoshi Department Store and takes guests through the ever-changing kawaii culture and its fluid impact on Japanese decor and style. And the Race Against the Sun exhibit is toward the left front side of the Morocco Pavilion and has dioramas showcasing the modern day racing competition in Morocco, Marathon of the Sands, and Rally of the Gazelles. And something I do all the time to get out of the crowds is track down peaceful lounges. Don't just rely on Disney's table service restaurants to get you out of the swarm of guests. Look for the lounges too. They're gonna be a lot less expensive. Disney World has several laid back lounges in their parks and resorts that you wouldn't normally need to make an advanced dining reservation for. Space 220 in Epcot is the anomaly here. You should make a reservation for their lounge. 
But let me hit you with some lounges you may want to track down while you're looking for a getaway from your getaway. Steakhouse 71 Lounge in Disney's Contemporary Resort features its own unique menu of small plates and drinks and brings a bar component to the modern Steakhouse 71 table service restaurant, but it's usually pretty empty in there. The lounge, that is, so that's a great place to go and sort of escape from the Magic Kingdom. Sanaa Lounge in Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge is an intimate watering hole with specialty beverages, wine flights, and signature appetizers. Now, it can be a little bit harder to get over to Kidani Village, so if you want to go ahead to Jombo House, Victoria Falls Lounge is lovely as well. And Nomad Lounge, of course, in Disney's Animal Kingdom, right next to the signature restaurant Tiffin's, offers up a nice, relaxing environment, both inside and out on its covered patio, though I definitely prefer inside to get that AC. But if it's a chill, relaxed, late fall or early spring day, the covered patio is truly wonderful. Nomad Lounge does get rather popular during the day, but it's small and capacity is limited, so it never feels super crowded or restricting in there. Just make sure to join the walk-up wait list on the My Disney Experience app through the dining tip board as soon as the lounge opens up, which is usually around 11 a.m. If crowd burnout is really getting to you, it's okay. There are quiet corners in the parks that you can retreat to. It's totally normal. Let's find a quiet corner. In Magic Kingdom, the Storybook Circus area near Dumbo the Flying Elephant has a yellow tent you can duck into. This has plenty of seating and even outlets for charging your phone. Nobody knows it's back there. Nobody goes back there, especially while the train's not running. So that place is a great spot for just chilling out. Over in Epcot, the Morocco Pavilion is often one of the more quiet pavilions since the restaurant isn't functioning back there right now. There's plenty of seating and shady spots for relaxing. In Disney's Animal Kingdom, the Oasis exhibits toward the front of the park have trails surrounded by greenery and waterfalls and flowers and nice little benches. And those are great places to chill because most people are just running right past the Oasis to get to their rides. And in Hollywood Studios, Star Wars Launch Bay is tucked away inside Animation Courtyard. It's severely overlooked and has been ever since Galaxy's Edge opened in 2019. But you can still check out very cool Star Wars exhibits here, which actually showcase movie props and authentic replicas. Oh, and back to merchandise, there's another way you can avoid the gift shop lines on Disney property aside from using the mobile checkout option on your My Disney Experience app, and that's by sticking with the Shop Disney website. Shop Disney lists a ton of park-specific merchandise that you can purchase from the comfort of your own home. And bonus, you'll often be able to get the same souvenirs you find in the parks for cheaper at ShopDisney.com thanks to their frequent sales and discounts. Also, something else that we found, a lot of the ears sold in the parks, those Mickey and Minnie ears, they're $34.99 in the parks right now, but they're still $29.99 on Shop Disney, so you can save five bucks right there. So if you shop on a day with free shipping, you're getting off scot-free, you don't have to carry the ears around, they're going straight to your house. And let's go back to mobile ordering real quick, because there's one more important thing I want to mention that'll help you navigate the quick service or fast food locations when you know those lines are going to be outrageous. You can start mobile ordering from quick service restaurants as early as 7 a.m. No, you can't order food for a 7 a.m. pickup since the parks won't even be open then, but you can still pre-order and prepay for a meal in advance, as well as select a return window that's going to work best for you and your family. The earlier you can place your mobile order, the more likely you're going to be able to lock down a return window that you prefer before they're all snatched up by other guests. But side reminder, even if you order your meal hours in advance, you may want to aim for a return window that'll hook you up with a later lunch, earlier dinner, or very early lunch. That way, even after you pick up your food, you won't be scrounging around for an open table at a packed out restaurant during those peak dining times. Our next tip to avoid the crowds in Disney World is to avoid those celebrations. So the Disney party atmosphere is a blast, like Disney's 50th anniversary celebration kickoff or Epcot's 40th anniversary or the opening days for the brand new rides and attractions or when Figment decides to appear on an exclusive popcorn bucket in Epcot and drive all the Figment collectors mad. But if your goal is to avoid the Disney crowds, then these are not the right times for you to be visiting. I'll always keep you updated on what's going to be happening around the parks through our latest news drops and that DFB newsletter, so you don't have to guess whether or not some big event is going to be happening during your trip. Believe me, we know when they're happening. So if you want to stay in the loop, keep in touch. Because those days are when the lines get the longest, when people are waiting hours for merchandise... And when all of the fans of that particular park or that particular celebration are coming in because they know there's brand new food and brand new experiences and they want to be there on that day for bragging rights. 
So if you don't necessarily care about that stuff, then it's time to avoid those days. But let's talk about a different type of party scene, the after hours party scene. After hours parties, AKA Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party and Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party, those are separately ticketed events that start at 7 p.m. They run until midnight in the Magic Kingdom. And with these, you'll be able to celebrate the season with special snacks and shows and parades and character meet and greets and minimum crowds. They only they only sell so many tickets for these particular parties. I think it's around 20,000, which is a very, very small day in the park since the park can hold 80 to 100,000 people. You can work this toward your advantage by hitting up the Magic Kingdom rides that normally push pretty high wait times during regular park hours. Ride them during the party hours. Just keep in mind that after hours parties are not automatically included with your regular ticket purchase and can oftentimes be just as pricey as a day ticket, if not more so. If you do pay for a party ticket, you don't have to pay for a regular park ticket and vice versa. Another bonus, if you stick with just the party ticket, you'll still be able to enter Magic Kingdom as early as 4 p.m. even though the party doesn't technically start until seven, so you'll get three extra hours to play. Now along the same lines, to avoid crowds, you're gonna to wanna to stay in the parks as long as you can. If you're not big on the celebration factor, but you like the idea of hanging in the parks after they're closed to everybody else, then you may be more interested in buying a ticket for the after hours events starting back up in January. After hours events will be available for Magic Kingdom starting January 9th and Hollywood Studios starts them January 4th. These separately ticketed events are gonna give you the chance to stay in the parks for three hours after they close, though much like the holiday parties, you'll still be able to enter the parks as early as 7 p.m. For Magic Kingdom, the event's gonna run between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., and for Hollywood Studios, between 9.30 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. Prices for these events can be a little on the steep side, ranging between $129 to $159 per person. But this could be worth it if you wanna wait less time for the rides you wanna experience and not have to worry about making Lightning Lane reservations all day long to do so. Just note, Figure out what's actually gonna be open in the parks on those after hours event days so that you know that your favorite ride is going to be open because sometimes they're not all open, heads up. You're also gonna to wanna to take advantage of resort benefits to skip those crowds. If you're staying at a Disney owned resort or at one of the select good neighbor hotels in the area, you're gonna be able to use the early theme park entry benefit to your advantage. Early theme park entry lets resort guests enter any of the parks on any of the days of the week 30 minutes before they actually open for the rest of the public, meaning you'll be able to get a head start and get in line for your must-do experiences right away. And don't forget those deluxe resort benefits too. If you're more of a night owl and have saved up for a hotel room splurge, you may be able to take advantage of a second major resort benefit. Extended evening hours are available for deluxe resort guests only and allow these guests to stay in the parks on certain nights up to two hours after they close for everybody else. And yes, that means the rides will stay open too in case there were any you couldn't hit up during the day because of the high crowd levels. But nope, not all of those rides will stay open. I was at an extended evening hours a few weeks ago thinking I was gonna be able to ride the people mover over and over and over again. And then they told me I had to get off because it wasn't open during extended evening hours. So check those lists. But before you book that deluxe resort room, double check the Disney World Park Hours calendar to make sure extended evening hours will be readily available during the time you're planning on staying. Because it'd be a shame if you got a deluxe resort for a three-day vacation only to find out the three days you booked have no extended evening hours available. Let's look at the month of December, for example. For Epcot, extended evening hours, when available, happen on Mondays. Magic Kingdoms happen on Wednesdays, and Disney's Hollywood Studios happen on Thursdays. But that doesn't mean they're not subject to change month after month. So always double check before dropping that dough. And even if you don't plan on using the early theme park entry benefit, it's still a good idea to get to the parks early for rope drop or park opening if you're trying to evade the worst of the ride lines. So here's a quick list of rides you're gonna to wanna to prioritize first thing in the morning because these tend to rack up heavy duty weights later on. Magic Kingdom, you're gonna prioritize Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in New Fantasyland and Space Mountain in Tomorrowland. For Epcot, hurry over to Test Track in World Discovery, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure in the France Pavilion or Frozen Ever After in the Norway Pavilion. Pavilion. Pretty much all other rides are going to be very palatable wait times. For Disney's Hollywood Studios, aim to get in line for Millennium Falcon, Smuggler's Run in Galaxy's Edge, Rise of the Resistance, also in Galaxy's Edge, or Slinky Dog Dash in Toy Story Land.
Usually Rise and Slinky are going to be the longest waits. Sometimes Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway sneaks in there too. And for Disney's Animal Kingdom, head on towards Flight of Passage in Pandora World of Avatar. You're also going to want to shop early. Disney Springs isn't immune to guest traffic jams, especially in the evenings and especially on the weekends. If you try coming here in the evening during the weekend, you are a brave, brave soul, my friend. Very brave indeed. To skip out on the hecticness that can be shopping and dining in Disney Springs, pick a morning to come and visit instead. More often than not, those early morning crowds are going to be populating the parks or catching some extra Zs, giving you plenty of space to do some browsing with no one breathing down your neck in the process. Process. Best part, you don't have to pay for a park ticket. It's free to go to Disney Springs. Just keep in mind that many shops don't start opening their doors until about 10 a.m., so you won't have to worry about getting to the shopping district at the same time you would rope drop a park. Okay, since I've now talked your ear off about getting to the parks early, it's time to play devil's advocate. While getting to the parks in time for rope drop does help you get ahead of the ride lines, you're still going to have to endure a wild crowd that's waiting to get into the parks. Now, this crowd will disperse once you scan your park ticket and make your way in, but if someone in your group really gets claustrophobic at the thought of being scrunched together with a bunch of strangers for an extended period of time, then this may not actually be the best time for you to head towards the parks. After the initial opening, the main entrance crowds will die down, but they're at the start of the day when Disney's not letting guests in quite yet, the masses can feel stifling. So just be prepared for that. And if you know you have someone in your group who can't handle that kind of crowd, then wait and go into the parks a little later. Another classic tip for you, don't bail on the rain. If Orlando decides to spit out one of their famous rainstorms, wait it out, my friends. There'll be some groups that call it quits. A lot of groups will call it quits once the clouds roll in. But if you stick around and hit up some of the other indoor experiences in the park while you wait, like a dark ride, a show, head into a gift shop or a table service restaurant, then you'll be able to reap the benefits of a much less crowded day once the sun decides to shine again, because it will. I've already told you to avoid extended evenings and big celebrations, but now I'm here to warn you about the Run Disney races. Disney holds several Run Disney events each year, which let runners and walkers alike take on 5Ks to full-on marathons around Disney World Resort. The event itself is great, and guests love getting the opportunity to accomplish such a big feat on Disney grounds. But if you're not wanting to participate, you're still going to have to fight against the crowds in the parks after the races conclude. So here's the current Run Disney race lineup for 2023 if you want to plan around these. Walt Disney World Marathon Weekend is January 4th to the 8th. Disney Princess Half Marathon Weekend is February 23rd to the 26th. The Run Disney Springtime Surprise Weekend will return April 13th to the 16th. And the Disney Wine and Dine Half Marathon, part of the Epcot Food and Wine Festival, is going to take place from November 2nd to November 5th. Now, here's something I don't recommend all that often. On the days when Magic Kingdom is holding an after-hours party, guests who don't have a separate event ticket will be asked to leave as early as 6 p.m. And that can feel like a big letdown if you were wanting to see the Cinderella Castle fireworks or get some last-minute late-night rides in before wrapping up the day. But Magic Kingdom crowds can be less intense on days when people know they won't be getting as much bang for their buck out of their tickets. So you may actually run into a little more area of relief than you would on days when the party isn't happening. This isn't necessarily a foolproof solution since December is just wildly busy all month long, but this has proven to be the case with earlier party celebrations that start up in August for Not So Scary Halloween Party and select days in November for Merry Christmas Party. Our next way to avoid the crowds is to dodge those super popular areas. Before I talked about places you'll want to escape to if you're feeling overwhelmed by the crowd levels. Now I'm going to tell you about park areas you'll want to escape from during the afternoon when attendance levels will peak for the day. In Magic Kingdom, the Fantasyland area with Peter Pan's flight and It's a Small World, that can bottleneck really, really badly during the day. So you may want to avoid that pathway in the afternoon and stick to the other areas and attractions in Fantasyland for the time being like under the sea journey of the little mermaid or the fill our magic 4d show and remember there are multiple ways to get everywhere in magic kingdom you may just have to walk a little further so you can avoid that sort of bottleneck area from fantasy land down into liberty square by those tangled toilets in hollywood studios galaxy's edge and toy story land get really busy during the heat of the day for me i like to aim toward toy story land at the start of the day since lots of folks are going to be rushing toward rise of the resistance and then i hit up galaxy's edge at night when people are starting to leave the park 
Park. In Epcot, that Mexico Pavilion crunch is both busy and non-busy simultaneously. And that's confusing. This is what I mean. The marketplace section inside the pavilion can get pretty packed out and make it look like it'll be too tricky to navigate. But if you keep pressing onward, you can escape inside La Cava del Tequila for a quick drink or catch a ride on the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the Three Caballeros or even get a reservation for San Angel in Restaurante. That way, you'll be able to get away from the market crowds and find the less crowded sections. But that area in front of the Mexico Pyramid, that's kind of a pinch point too. Once you get through there, things tend to open up and widen out a little bit in China. And in Disney's Animal Kingdom, Pandora World of Avatar can get super busy, but there are so many other parts of Animal Kingdom you can head toward instead, like Rafiki's Planet Watch, Dino Land USA, or any of those animal trails. Next on our list to avoid the crowds, don't leave when everyone else does. One of the worst crowds you're gonna experience during your Disney World trip is at the very end of the night in Magic Kingdom, after the fireworks wrap up and the roaring applause has died down. Cause once this happens, everybody is gonna be flooding toward the exit to get on a bus or a boat or a monorail. And I'm sorry, it's just miserable. I cannot sugarcoat that, it is awful. So here's what you do instead. You either A, leave before the madness begins and slip out of Magic Kingdom a few minutes before the show ends, or you stick around as the mass exodus happens around you. Those Main Street USA gift shops will stay open for a little bit longer after the park officially closes, so you can still shop for a bit if you'd like. Or if that's still too people-y for you, you can mobile order a treat from the Main Street confectionery instead. Don't forget to mobile order it before the park closes. You can pick it up after the park closes, but you gotta mobile order it before. That way you can pick up that treat and just sit, relax, and munch for a spell while you soak in the remaining time you've got in Magic Kingdom. And of course, if you want to watch the fireworks from somewhere other than Main Street, you can watch them near one of your favorite rides or a ride you haven't ridden yet and jump in line for that ride right when the park closes. You'll still be able to ride and then you'll be able to leave when there's nobody else crowding the pathways. Disney World buses can be convenient, but they can also be a nightmare. Maybe you wanna upgrade your transportation to avoid the crowds. Even if you do finally get on a bus back to your hotel room at the end of the night, all the seats might already be taken and you're forced to stand on your already sore feet. And you're also pressed up against other guests who are also forced to stand and are just as cranky and hot and tired as you are, so fun times. This may be a good time to go the rideshare route instead. Ride shares like Uber and Lyft are premium taxi-like services that give you private rides whenever, wherever. But if you decide to go the rideshare route at the end of your Disney night, we've got two words of warning for you. First, don't be nervous if you book a rideshare and it cancels on you. Sometimes rideshare drivers do not want to deal with end of the night Disney traffic either. Just try again and you should find someone who's ready to roll. Second, if you're looking to catch an Uber or Lyft ride out of Magic Kingdom at the end of the night, you're still going to have to take a ferry or monorail to the transportation and ticket center, meaning you're still going to have to deal with the massive crowds. To avoid feeling like that, you may want to invest in a minivan instead, which is Disney World's very own rideshare service operated through Lyft. If you book a minivan, it'll pick you up around the bus area so you don't have to jump through a whole lot of extra hoops to track it down in the TTC, but you will have to pay a bit extra for that convenience. Now, if those 100 plus minute waits for Tower of Terror are not worth it for you during the day, and if there's a ride you haven't been able to go on because the wait times are absolutely over the top, and that means the crowds are over the top too, try getting in line for it at the very end of the night, like 10 to 30 minutes before the park closes. Around this time, guests are more focused on migrating toward the exit or nighttime shows, meaning wait times could be significantly cut. And even if you get in line for a ride 15 minutes before the park closes, and the ride is still projected as a 45 minute wait, like I said, you're still gonna be able to ride. If you are in line, the minute the park closes, you will still be able to ride. As long as you're in the queue before the queue closes, you're golden. So you've got your main queue line, you've got your lightning lane queue line, but some rides have a third totally free to use queue that also has the potential of being shorter than the standard lines. And that's the single rider line. Single riders help cast members fill in all the available seats on a particular ride. So if you do jump in the single rider line, you're gonna be a part of that solution. Meaning you'll be paired with a stranger, but still be able to hopefully get on the ride faster. 
Sometimes we've found that the single rider line can still be pretty lengthy, but other times they've given us the chance to basically walk up onto a ride with little to no weight. We've done this several times with Expedition Everest Legend of the Forbidden Mountain. So if you don't mind breaking up your group for the sake of saving time, here are the rides that currently offer single rider queues. Soarin' in Epcot, Test Track in Epcot, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run in Hollywood Studios, Rock and Roller Coaster in Hollywood Studios, and Expedition Everest in Animal Kingdom. By the way, the Soarin' single rider line is kind of come and go. Sometimes they're using it, sometimes they're not. So not a good one to rely on in your planning. For some, a Disney trip doesn't feel complete without an end of the night Cinderella Castle fireworks display. So if you're just looking for some Magic Kingdom fireworks and you don't necessarily care about the projection show and all the people that'll be there to watch it around the hub and down Main Street USA, then consider watching the show from these places instead, which will be much less crowded. If you're in Magic Kingdom, station yourself behind Cinderella Castle and watch the display near Prince Charming's Regal Carousel. Just don't block any pathways for the other guests trying to make their way past. Don't mind splurging? You can always make reservations for a Magic Kingdom dessert party, which will reserve you a seat at Tomorrowland Terrace or standing room in the Plaza Garden, depending on which dessert party you choose. This will also give you the chance to watch the projections too, but you will have to pay around $99 to $114 per adult for that privilege. California Grill at Disney's Contemporary Resort also has great fireworks viewing from their 15-story balcony vantage point, which comes along with a full prefix meal for $89 per person. Or if you snag yourself some bar seating, you will not have to pay the prefix meal price. Now note, you won't see the projections from here, just the fireworks. If you want to save some money, plop right on down in the sand at one of the monorail resort beach sites for a free show. We've had great views from the beaches around Disney's Polynesian Village Resort and Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa. Then bonus, you'll also be able to watch the electrical water pageant on the Seven Seas Lagoon from these beachy areas too. So stick around after the fireworks for the extra show. Ready to meet Mickey Mouse? Great. Ready to wait in a 60 plus minute line to meet Mickey Mouse? No. If meeting a particular character or several characters is a big deal for your group, you can feed two birds with one scone and book a character dining experience instead. Character dining not only gets you fed, but gives you the chance to meet your Disney pals without having to leave your table. And you can meet a whole bunch of them at once. Just note that some character dining experiences can still get busy, especially the more popular restaurants like Chef Mickey's at Disney's Contemporary Resort. For a less crowded character dining experience, consider booking one of these instead. Garden Grill at Epcot, one of my favorites, very small restaurant, not a lot of people, so you get to see the characters quite a bit. Tobolino's Terrace Breakfast with Mickey and Friends at Disney's Riviera Resort or Storybook Dining at Artist Point with Snow White at Disney's Wilderness Lodge. By the way, another good tip for character dining if you go right at the end of the night. Most families have left or are on their way out, so you may get a chance to get pictures with all the characters at once. That happens to us once at Crystal Palace. The food isn't as good because it's pretty much just whatever's left over from what they made for the night, but if characters are your goal, that's a good choice. Now here's a great tip to have a great meal with fewer people around you. If you want to skip out on prime dining times for breakfast and lunch, choose neither and book a reservation for brunch instead if the option is available. Since brunch is technically an off hour for dining, crowds will be lighter and reservations might be easier to make for the more popular restaurants. Not to mention eating a meal at 10 or 10.30 a.m. means you're not only potentially still going to be paying those cheaper breakfast prices, but you'll also be good and fed for two meals at the price of one. A lot of people don't choose brunch in Disney World because they're already in the parks and they're already riding. So if you're there, there won't be nearly as many people around you as there would have been at 8 a.m. or as there would be at noon. Now, remember I talked about the roads less traveled in Disney and how Grand Floridian has a walkway path straight to Magic Kingdom while the resorts around Epcot's International Gateway have paths that connect not only to Epcot, but to Hollywood Studios too? Yeah, those resorts can be really nice to book if you don't want to deal with Disney bus crowds or just transportation crowds in general. The downside, they can be very, very expensive. Swan and Dolphin, two hotels within walking distance to Epcot and Hollywood Studios and the Skyliner, typically have much more affordable, moderate price points than the other Disney-owned deluxe resorts. And yet Swan and Dolphin still offer up all the same types of deluxe resort benefits, including extended evening hours. And if you're a Marriott Rewards member, you can also use your points tour to stay here for even more savings, since Swan and Dolphin are actually owned by Marriott and partner with Disney to make things more convenient for guests. It's a great deal to be able to walk to two parks and not have to fight those bus battles. 
Sometimes you don't even want to mess with the Disney ride lines. You just want to have a great time, not scrunched up against a whole bunch of people in a seemingly never ending line. I get it. I feel the same. So if you want something else to do during the busier parts of the day, consider a Disney side quest, AKA Disney scavenger hunt. Disney World likes to create interactive experiences for guests to participate in whenever they want to in order to keep engaged with the parks without waiting in crowds to do so. So here are some of the interactive and absolutely free experiences you and your kids can participate in at the parks. In Magic Kingdom, you can become a scallywag during a pirate's adventure, Treasures of the Seven Seas, where you'll hunt down riches and interactive checkpoints throughout Adventureland. In Epcot, kids can collect Kid Cot activity cards around each pavilion in the World Showcase, and they can also help Dory track down her fellow fishy comrades at Sea Base with the Finding Dory's Friends, a fantastic scavenger hunt booklet. In Disney's Hollywood Studios, you can download the Play Disney Parks app and help Hondo Anaka with a few odd jobs around the planet of Batu. And in Disney's Animal Kingdom, your kids can join the wilderness explorers like Russell and collect badges around different parts of the park. Again, totally free. Crowds are hard to fully escape, even in the bathrooms. No, scratch that, especially in the bathrooms. If you're looking for more privacy while on the porcelain throne, here are some bathrooms you can scout out for some extra peace and quiet. In Magic Kingdom, the restrooms on Main Street USA tucked away next to City Hall might be right there at the park entrance, but they're still often overlooked since many guests are too distracted by the view of Cinderella Castle to pay them any mind. These bathrooms can still get pretty crowded by the end of the night when people are stalling to leave the park, but in the morning, they're fairly unoccupied. And if you head down Main Street USA and you turn right at the ice cream parlor towards Tomorrowland Terrace, there will be some restrooms on your right that are rarely crowded as well. In Epcot, head to the restrooms in the American Adventure Pavilion. These are also tucked out of the way of all the action and located to the left of the American Adventure Theater. And they're spacious too. There's also a great restroom to the right of the American Adventure Theater that's absolutely beautiful. In Disney's Hollywood Studios, between the Once Upon a Time and Legends of Hollywood gift shops, you're gonna find restrooms off Sunset Boulevard. These won't necessarily be ghost towns, but they're usually way less busy than the restrooms right outside Tower of Terror or next to Rock and Roller Coaster. So if you plan to make a pit stop before you ride, this gift shop location could be a better option for you. And in Disney's Animal Kingdom, if you can hit up the bathrooms right outside the theater in the wild where Finding Nemo, the Big Blue and Beyond happens daily, then you'll experience one of the quietest restrooms across all of the parks. However, this is only the case when a show hasn't just wrapped up because when guests are exiting the theater in droves, they'll be turning toward this run first. When you just want to throw your hands up and call it quits with all the Disney dining crowds, listen to Anna's advice and do the next right thing. In this case, the next right thing for your sanity is getting a meal door dashed to your hotel instead. Food delivery apps like DoorDash or Uber Eats, Grubhub, whatever, can pick up food for you outside the Disney bubble cheaper and take it over to where you're staying. You won't be able to have food delivered straight to your hotel room. That's not safe. You don't want to do that anyway. But you can still pick it up at Bell Services when it arrives. Now you can have a nice, quiet meal in the comfort of your resort. If you're going to run into heavier crowd levels at the Disney World resorts, you'll usually experience them around 3 to 4 p.m. And that's because standard check-in times for the deluxe resorts happen at 4 p.m., while all other resort standard check-in times happen at 3. This excludes the campsites at Fort Wilderness, which should have a place for you set up once 1 p.m. rolls around. And that means front desk crowds can be wildly busy. Good thing you don't have to check in at the front desk to still get a room and key assigned to you. Instead of waiting in line to check in at the front, use online check-in to get ahead of the game. You can actually check into your hotel 60 days before your stay, meaning when you arrive, all you've got to do is wait for Disney to get your room ready. When your room is available, the My Disney Experience app will send you a notification to let you know the room number. You should be able to unlock your hotel room door automatically with your magic band, but if you don't have one, you should be able to unlock it automatically with your My Disney Experience app. If you're already all checked in online and you make it to your resort before your room is ready, take advantage of the extra time. The earlier you get to your resort, the more time you'll be able to spend there, checking out all the different amenities and offerings. You might even be able to go ahead and jump in the pool for a little while. That means you beat the crowds and get more bang for your buck. Now, if you absolutely 110% cannot stand theme park crowds of any kind, you've got two options. First, don't go because crowds will find you at some point of time, even if you're trying to evade them if you go to the Disney parks. Or two, drop the big money on a private VIP tour. 
Private VIP tours give guests the opportunity to hop onto the front of the lines for pretty much any attraction you want to prioritize. No lightning lanes necessary. A personal guest services cast member will take your group, which can hit a max of 10 guests, on a customizable trip around the parks while also dropping you tons of trivia tidbits and insider knowledge along the way. Sounds fabulous, right? But again, the big kicker is the cost. Private VIP tours are booked at a seven hour minimum with prices ranging from $425 to $850 per hour, depending on the date. And get this, prices do not include the price you still need to pay for your theme park ticket. But if this is a once in a lifetime trip for you and you can split that expense with nine of your closest family members or friends who wanna join you on this adventure, this could still wind up being a worthy investment. But you don't have to drop thousands for a Disney World tour if you don't want to. There are several other behind the scenes opportunities available that still give you the chance to see a unique side of Disney that most guests won't be able to experience. Tours are capped out at a limited number of guests, so you don't have to worry about ever being too overcrowded at any given time. Here are just a few of the many tours you can book before your vacation on top of your regular ticket price. Behind the Seeds takes you through Epcot's living with the land, greenhouses, laboratories, and fish farms. Caring for Giants gets you an up close and personal view of the elephants living in Disney's Animal Kingdom. Starlight Safari at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge takes you and your group around the resort's personal savanna for an animal tour, night vision goggles included. And one more for the road, Disney's Keys to the Kingdom Tour takes you around the backstage of Magic Kingdom to check out all the inner workings of that park. So there you have it, 50 ways to get around swarms of Disney World crowds and make the most of your limited time in the parks. Remember, we've got all 50 points typed up and ready to send your way whenever you want them. So don't forget to drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash avoid crowds so we can get this list over to you ASAP. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.